Davide Dormino, you are now in London with the Anything to Say Sculptors. You said uh, in your message that this is the most hostile location. Why did you leave this one till last? Because we tried to bring the statue here during these last eight years and uh, we didn't receive any permission. So finally we have it and we are in an amazing place. Of course we are you know, not a good situation because Julian could be extradited very soon. So this is one of the last opportunity we have to protest yeah. and, and you know, for to support him. What are you going to do with the sculptures after now? We continue. We continue continues the journey. Yes. Uh, because people must be informed on on this amazing story. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes art has the opportunity to show us the contradictions of our times. And yeah. this is a, a very amazing story. Yes. Of course, you know, it will go on if he is taken to the United States, right? So maybe you could head over there. Yeah, of course. It would be hard because, it, you know, until he's in, in Europe, we can do something. But when we, if we will arrive in, uh, in, uh, in America, there's an ocean in the between, so it would be more hard. Yeah. We have to create uh, supporters in, in America and, uh, yeah, and continues to push. Yes. So, uh, what do you think is uh, one of the stronger, the strongest reason why Julian should not be extradited? You've been thinking about it? Or? Because, because uh, you know, uh, the only the public opinion is the only things that can save Julian. Because the law has failed, the politician has failed, and uh, you know, he defined the secret power of the world. Yeah. He's the enemy number one, so he's a, pre a political prisoner. Yes. So you think uh, that Britain has been fully complicit? Say again, sorry? Do you think Britain has been complicit in this, his persecution? Uh, everybody is... is uh, Complicit. Uh, complicit. Everybody of us. Because yes. until we don't stand on that chair and yeah. we take a position, yes. we are complicit. Yeah. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Parliament Square. My name is John Rees from the Don't Extradite Assange campaign. This is the sixth time that we have attempted to bring this magnificent Anything to Stay statue uh, to London. We tried to bring it to London squares, we tried to bring it to uh, uh, churches, we were refused every single time, and so we decided to do the only thing left open to us, and that was to have a public demonstration in Parliament Square, in defence of Julian Assange, and we're very pleased to have the Anything to Say statue here as our platform uh, today. So we. This is a very, very urgent, this is a very, very urgent moment. This is really the 11th hour for Julian Assange in the British court system. So you will hear this many times this afternoon. Please, whatever you have done so far to help this campaign, to defend the free press, please do more now. Now is exactly the right moment to pull out every single stop to stop Julian Assange being, a, being extradited to the United States and put on trial for crimes which he did not commit and for being a journalist. That cannot stand. Please redouble your campaigning efforts. Now, the first person that I've got here to speak to today is an MP who stood by Julian Assange from the beginning. He's the only MP to have got in to Belmarsh to see Julian Assange. Please welcome Labour MP John McDonnell. Thank 
Professor Wood. Can we just see? Can we thank the artists who's with us who created this formation? Thank you very much for this piece of work. It says more eloquently in stature form what most of us can say. As I said, I'm John McDonald, I'm a Labour MP, but I'm the secretary of the National Union of Journalists Parliamentary Group. So our job is to speak up for journalists in Parliament. And we speak up for journalists who've been abused, imprisoned, and sometimes who've lost their lives performing their role in democratic and undemocratic societies, which is to expose the truth and to hold politicians to account for their decisions. Julian Assange is a journalist. He, he undertook, yes, a perilous mission, but it was a mission that had to happen, which was to expose the truth about the war crimes that were taking place, often in our name, in Iraq and elsewhere. And for standing up for the truth, for exposing the truth, as any true journalist would, he's been in prison year after year. Only a couple of miles away from us in Belmarsh now, is the longest serving political prisoner that there is in this country. We now know more about the role of the state in this country too, thanks to the work of another journalist called Stefania Massini. She has been absolutely dogged over the last eight years in pursuing the truth about how Julian was treated in this country, and in particular, the role of the Crown Prosecution Service. We now know more as a result of those freedom of information requests about how much collusion there was between the Crown Prosecution Service here and the Swedish authorities to secure Julian's extradition to America. And we know the risk to his life if he's extradited. We'll continue to expose that. But I believe it brings shame upon this country for the role it has played in the persecution of a journalist who simply wanted to do what journalists should do, is report the truth. That's why in this coming, few, this coming period now, exactly as John Rees has said, this is absolutely critical now. We do all that we can to prevent the extradition. But I think more importantly, we demand the freedom of Julian Assange. Yeah. He should be heard with his family. Yeah. 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 Julian Assange's imprisonment and persecution brings eternal shame on this country. And we need to continue to expose it and stand in solidarity. So I, I think all of us here today, let's recommit ourselves to this campaign. Freedom for Julian Assange, protection of journalists, and yes, all those who speak the truth. Solidarity. Thanks so much, John, for being grateful for your support. And now I'd like to welcome the person who sculpted these magnificent statues, uh, the Italian sculptor uh, Davide Tornino. Please give him a huge welcome for all the work that he's done for this picture. When men are silent for too long, sometimes it's the statue that speaks. And this is, this is a perfect place. Mandela is here. Gandhi is here. And Millicent Garrett Fawcett is here. Heart cannot change the world, but it has the capacity to give us a different vision to show us the contradiction of our time and see the world with new eyes. This sculpture is intended to be a weapon of critical mass construction. There is a moment when dissent becomes a duty. Yes. And this is the proof. Free Assange! For the, for the work and for the effort of bringing you here. Um, now, my, the next speaker that I want to introduce you to 
is a fantastic MP. She's had a hard time staying an MP. We're all incredibly glad that she is. And she's been a supporter of Julian Assange uh, since the very beginning. Please welcome to the stage uh, the MP for the Labour Party, Absama Begum. or in touch with or your friends or your family because there will soon be a date given by the court to bring Julian Assange's final appeal uh, before them. We may not have much time when that happens but when it happens it's extraordinarily important that there is the most massive demonstration so far in support of Julian Assange outside the court on that day so please do Link up with the DEA website and with our Twitter feed and Facebook and look out for that announcement and when it comes, please be able to respond and to mobilise on an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented scale. Now my next speaker is Stella Assange. She needs no introduction uh, to you, but she has fought relentlessly and with such courage that I ask you please to give her an enormous welcome here. Uh, 
I'm getting asked, where are we at? Well, we're really at the end game now. The fight is on. This is my message. Yes, the legal avenues have narrowed dramatically, but we were ready for this, right? We know what kind of battle we're fighting. A political battle, a fight against injustice, where people speaking out, witnessing this, this, this injustice, and giving it a name is what will stop it. This statue here today has this message, anything to say. These three men are every man. They witnessed injustice and they spoke up. And we need to speak up just like they did. Because that's what makes us human. By gagging them, by imprisoning them, by punishing them, they're punishing all of us. Because they told us what we needed to know about injustice being carried out in our name against us. Julian depends on each and every one of you and every person you can speak to, to inform them, to move them into understanding what's at stake. And what's at stake is democracy itself. Yes. The case against Julian goes to the heart, the fundamentals of what it means to live in an open, democratic society where we can challenge authority, where we can speak up, whether we're right or wrong. We have to be able to speak, to refine our ideas, to be able to be challenged. And just because there are people in position of authority, they're abusing their authority, they're abusing the legislation, they're abusing uh, the surveillance tools that have been developed over the last decade or so, and they're abusing the coercive powers of the state, physical and digital, to prevent you from speaking out. We are losing our rights. Julia's case is caught up in a trajectory in which we are all losing our rights. And yes. the right to freedom of speech is at the center of all, all our democratic rights. It underpins everything. We will lose all our rights if we lose the freedom of speech. And Julian's case is the most righteous case of freedom of speech. Today, in our generation, in this century, we have to free him. His life depends on it, but all our, our lives and our liberties also depend on it. Thank you. Free Julian Assange. <laughs> we never need the microphone after we tell us here, it's just kind of superfluous. Um, but I just want to say a word or two about journalism. Because there are really only two types of journalism. There's the type that prints the corporate handouts and the government press releases. And there's the type of journalism that prints what they don't want you to know. Now Julian Assange is in trouble because he's the kind of journalist that prints what you need to know but they don't want you to know. And it's a special pleasure now to introduce a journalist who does exactly the same thing. Please welcome to the platform Matt Taibbi. So I have a confession to make. Um, like a lot of journalists, when Julian first arrived on the scene, I didn't like him. Um, among other things, he had cool hair, he was skinny, uh, he even did Fashion Week here in London, I think, uh, at one point. Uh, and among other things, he was breaking all these huge stories. And really, just to get down to it, I, I was jealous. Uh, one more minute. Um, we're in London, so I might as well quote Shakespeare. You know, beware of the green on, I like monster and guff. 
mock the meat it feeds on and all that. We journalists were jealous of Julian Assange. And I didn't have a good reason for being jealous of him, so I invented one. And the reason I invented was I didn't like the idea of radical transparency. I thought, this is irresponsible. How can you just dump all these secrets on people? They have to be filtered out by re responsible people. And I thought, I thought of myself as a free thinker at the time. And I was so brainwashed that I forgot, as a lot of people forget, that secrets do not belong to governments. Secrets don't belong to governments. Information, all this information, belongs to us. Governments govern at the consent of the governed. If they want to keep secrets, they have to do it with our permission. Yes! They must serve us! Now, I'm an American. There's a lot of... I know there are some Americans here. There are a lot, uh, obviously a lot of people from the UK here. We have a lot of secrets right now. Yes. Why is that? We're, bu we're building skyscrapers and huge underground complexes because we don't have a place to keep all of it. Why is that? And Julian answered that question. I want to quote from an essay, essay he wrote. He wrote, authoritarian regimes give rise to forces which oppose them by pushing against the individual and collective will to freedom, truth, and self-realization. Plans which assist authoritarian rule, once discovered, induce resistance. Hence, these plans are concealed by successful authoritarian powers. Now, translate that in a brief way. The worse the government is, the more secrets there are. And we have a lot of secrets now. Now, Julian Assange, there's a brutal irony about this. He, he became famous at a time when, particularly America, but mo a lot of the Western governments were building a vast secret state to deal with what they called the threat of foreign terrorism. They built a complex of secret prisons, programs of extraordinary rendition, um, all the terrible things that we learned about in part because of, uh, in large part, because of WikiLeaks. Today, the awful thing about what's happening with Julian Assange is that governments are openly being repressive. They openly want to put this man in jail for 175 years. Now why are they doing that? Most of the charges have to do with the Espionage Act. What is the Espionage Act? Well, it contains offenses like conspiracy to obtain national defense information. What is national defense information? Well, as it happens, when I asked about this, it's basically anything they say it is. So, what is conspiracy to obtain national defense information? There's another word for that, too. It's journalism. <laughs> they want to put him in jail for 175 years for practicing journalism. If this were Andrei Sakharov or Nelson Mandela, every human rights organization in the world would be appalled at this. Yes. They would call this the worst human rights offense of our generation. But because the West is doing this, we get silence from our media. That is inexcusable. The well, last thing I'll say is, if you're okay with this happening to Julian Assange, you better be okay with it happening to a whole lot of other people, because that's going to be uh, the reality in about 10 minutes. Um, if they get away with doing this, that's why it's so important to rally now to prevent this hap from happening. Yes. They're preventing his extradition, preventing his imprisonment in the United States. Once they get away with this, the floodgates will be open, and this will become a co common occurrence. There will be no more speeches in parks. It will just be something that happens every day and people won't even notice anymore. If we want to prevent that from happening, we have to act now. Yes! 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 yes. No! So, so do no. not let this happen free Julian Assange. Thank you very much. Thank you.
beginning, from the very beginning, there's been the closest possible association between the material that Julian Assange released and the anti-war movement. When I went down to report at the Frontline Club on the initial revelations of the Afghan war logs, it was because I was one of the founder members of the Stop the War Coalition in this country. It's for that reason that one of the most commonly seen interviews with Julian Assange is the one where he's just stepped off the platform at a Stop the War Coalition demonstration in Trafalgar Square. And from that day to this, the anti-war movement in this country has stood solidly with Julian Assange. And for that reason, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, a speaker from the Stop the War Coalition, Shabir Akka. Thank you and thank you all for being out here today. The imprisonment and the torture of Julian Assange is an absolute crime. His treatment shows us with absolute clarity that we do not live in a democratic society. We do not have a free press. The message from the state is that if you dare expose their crimes, if you dare to oppose their narrative, they will bring down their full weight against you. And how much clearer can it be when the man who exposed this government's butchering of the people of Afghanistan and Iraq is languishing in prison, facing extradition in 175 years in an American cell, while the man who was responsible for the butchering of those people, the mass murderer of war criminal Tony Blair, walks free, but he was rewarded with a knighthood. He continues to expand his empire by advising dictators and murderers on how to carry out their crimes. At the moment, it is no surprise that this government is pushing so hard to extradite Julian Assange, while they are also at simultaneously passing laws to restrict our ability to protest, to restrict our ability to strike, to give the police and the state even more powers against us. And at the same time, they are pushing for a mass escalation of a war that threatens to expand and it, that threatens the lives of millions and millions of more people. So we have an absolute duty when they try to stop us to protest, to protest even more. When they, when they beat the drums of war, to make sure that we mobilize and stop their warmongering. Yeah. And we know that the, even in the case of Julian Assange, it is not something that will be decided in a vacuum in the courts. The court of public opinion matters. The yeah. pressure that we build on the streets matters. And yeah. that's why we need to keep turning out in bigger numbers for Julian Assange. We need to turn out in bigger numbers to oppose the war in Ukraine and we need to turn out in bigger numbers to stop this authoritarian government from removing our hard-won democratic rights and civil liberties. So I just want to make one plug which is that on the 8th of July the Stop the War Coalition has a national day of action against the war in Ukraine calling for peace. Please if you're not already a member of Stop the War join it, come out on the streets and let's make the case against war, let's defend Julian Assange, let's build on his legacy. See you all in the streets. Thanks very much. And now I want to ask Kristen Hartson, the editor in chief of WikiLeaks, to come to the platform to explain to us exactly where we are now in this struggle and what we need to do next. Kristen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, words and lawyers. English is not my first language, so I'm fascinated about the use of language and words and how it is abused and used in the battle against justice. Thirteen years ago when I started working with Julian, preparing the release of the collateral murder video, I'm sure that all of you have seen, it struck me that uh, they used the word engagement 
in a certain context. No, for me, engagement was something that had a pleasant connotation. This was the use, the word that used when people got together and decided to tie the knot, as I think you call it, until death to them apart. But in the vocabulary of the American military, engagement, yes, it does have to do with death, but it means fatal killing. That is the engagement that the lawyers in Pentagon came up with when they drew up the rules, the rules of engagement. And those were the rules the lawyers drew up and the helicopter pilots were thinking about when they asked for permission to engage, to open fire, to assassinate Matasha Tomal, an innocent civilian who came upon the scene to save the life of an injured man, Said Sma, who worked for Reuters. Permission to engage, they asked. Give us permission to engage. Before they opened fire and sprayed 30 millimeter hollow bullets upon the vehicle were inside were the two children, Said and Sma, who were only saved because their father threw his body over them and shielded them in front of the car. Think about these lawyers who are sitting, drawing up of these documents, finding new meanings to these words. Engagement. It's killing. And think about the fact that Julian is being indicted for publishing these rules of engagement. You are not even allowed or supposed to see the rules they play by in their assassination games in wars. They do not charge him for publishing the collateral murder video for one purpose only, because they do not dare to have that shown in a courtroom at any point. And you know why. This is how they use language. We all know how the lawyers in Pentagon and the Department of Justice drew up manuals on how the military could torture prisoners. But of course they didn't call it torture. What shall we call it so it sounds better? Enhanced interrogation techniques. That's waterboarding 80 times, 90 times. Electrocution, hanging up on the hand until you are disjointed on the arms. Torture, pure, no enhanced interrogation techniques. Bravo, thank now, you. Now, I want to draw up a little scene that we came to learn about in January this year, when Mike Pompeo, former CIA director, later Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo was director of CIA in 2017, and he was very hopeful that he could become the Republican nominee for election next year. So of course he published a book, his memoir, his fond memoir, from the halls of power when he was director of CIA and later Secretary of State. And think about this. He tells a story that just before Christmas 2017, he sat in a cozy atmosphere with his family. Think about this atmosphere. And the wife is preparing the dinner, I guess. There are decoration, the Christmas tea is up, the gifts on the floor. And he tells that he was sitting browsing through and reading the manual on extrajudicial killings. Shame! That's the Christmas that uh, Pompeo wanted and liked the most. And why is this relevant? Yes, because we now know that in the same period, because of brave journalists who did deep investigation, there were plans being drawn up to assassinate Julian Assange. Shame! To kill him or assassinate him in the Ecuadorian embassy. A real plan that was introduced in the White House. And we furthermore know this because two brave witnesses who are protected have issued statements that they knew about this plan and poisoning was being discussed. That was what Pompeo was concocting just before Christmas 2017 by head of the CIA. Criminal! Empire! 
We are possibly not going to hear about all this in the court of law, in the extradition hearing, and the high court. Why? Because on 6th of January, Justice Swift, as he, his name his name is Justice Swift, decided after almost nine months of deliberation to spit out three and a half pages of his ruling that he saw no reason for Julian Assange to have an appeal in high court. No ruling at all. He complained about the mass of paperwork and documents that he was pestered to go through. 200 pages, too long. It's about a man's life. That's a defense document. It should have been less. I see nothing there. The story about the plan to kidnap and kill Julian Assange no, it's just a journalistic story. It's based on 30 named and unnamed sources published in Yahoo News, written by three prominent investigative journalists. No, it's just some speculation by our journalists. The protective witnesses who knew that there was a plan to poison Julian Assange. No, not worthy of being heard in the High Court in London, said Justice Swift. And on and on he went, in the three and a half pages. He didn't go through any detail. He didn't bother. That document, you should read it. It clarifies for us that the entire judicial process in this country is a facade. Yeah. It's a total facade. Yes, it is. And it's injustice, persecution, cloaked in to make it look like it's justice, but it's not. And the more steps we take in the courts here in London, the more obvious it becomes. And Justice Swift, he doesn't even spend much effort in trying to cloak the real fact of the matter that he had already decided to take a politicized opinion before he even got the 200 documents. And I doubt that he read through the entire thing. He was probably reading the memoirs by the great Mike Pompeo at the time. Change! On Jonathan Swift! It's My so good cool. friend, Craig Murray, wrote an excellent piece the other day. Please read him and support him. He is very good. And he reminded people how fascism and Nazism crept into the German psyche in the 30s. And there was no shortage of lawyers and scholars, legal scholars, to write up the justification for the wrongdoing. And at the Nuremberg trial, there was no shortage of documents, probably more than 200, as a defense document. Oh, listen, it's all in the laws. It has been passed out laws, and these legal scholars, they said I was in the right. And we got the orders to do it. It's called the Nuremberg Defense. It was dismissed at the Nuremberg trial. When it comes to these heinous acts, you have to be accountable, no matter what the lawyers have drawn up, yes! no matter what the facade has, and that is what we are going to be having in mind. Yeah. We are going to hold these people account. Every yeah. individual yeah. that has taken part in this Let's persecution against Julian Assange. Yeah. Do not forget that. Yeah. We will get history, if not history, to judge these people. And they will be spat on. Yeah. Yeah. And the sons and daughters and granddaughters and grandsons they will be ashamed of the legacy of those individuals in the court, in the entire bloody corrupt system who took part in this persecution. But we are all, almost running out of time. We need to save a man's life. We need to save journalism. We need to act now and we cannot stay silent. We need to scream out from the top of our voice. Stop this. No extradition! Free Julian Assange! We are at five minutes to midnight in this case. There is a crucial and possibly final court case on the horizon. When the announcement comes of the date of that case, please be ready.
Kristen Raffinson, we have heard a lot about radical transparency today in one speech, about Americans being brainwashed into thinking Julian had just dumped information. Now, for those of us who were in the courtroom, we heard of the ingenious way that Julian had invented using a dictionary, for example, finding words that weren't in the dictionary, they were proper names. So can you tell us something about redaction? Because it seems to me that this is so important. Well, I mean, I, it's, it's shocking that, that these evidence that you were mentioning uh, which is, is, is so much goes against this propaganda narrative which is being held up. We are not allowed possibly to present it to a high court because it's a, it's a huge, of course, argument in favor of Julian. I can tell you, and I testify to that, that after 20 years in the mainstream media, often handling uh, leaked material and, uh, and uh, sensitive issues, I have never ex experienced as solid diligence in handling material and sensitivity in handling the material as in the case of Julian when we were working on the 2010-2011 uh, publications. Great links that uh, Julian and the team went to in, in order to safeguard every sensitivity. We went further, actually, in some instances, in that process, that the mainstream media that we were cooperating with, we redacted more than the New York Times. People, there was absolutely no dumping of material. Careful, journalistic, sensible curation of the material before it was presented to the public, both when it came to the Afghan warlock, the Iraq warlock, and the diplomatic cables especially. So this propaganda voice that's been hammered on for 13 years now and echoed in the mainstream media is totally without any foundation. And it's so easy to just, if people would listen, to present them with the evidence of it. And it's in the core documents that Julian is now trying to present in his appeal, but possibly will not be heard. Well, in the case of the State Department cables, didn't Julian also contact the United States government and request their help? Redactions and what happened? There, there, was, there, were, there were more than one approaches and attempts to involve the State Department and offer to create an alliance at the outset and uh, at the, in, in the summer of 2011, when, of course, through the betrayal of, of two Guardian journalists and, and other former uh, insiders and WikiLeaks, uh, the material was exposed. Then, of course, steps were taken to, to uh, warn the State Department and offer to assist in uh, reacting to that possible scenario. That was not answered. And bear in mind, when it came to the diplomatic cables, as has been testified to in the courts in London, the primary publisher of the material, in the end, of the full unreducted material, was not WikiLeaks. It was an American entity. Crypto. Crypto. Yes. And even uh, Mr. Young, the founder of has Crypto, has offered sue me. Because he knows that he will can take on a fight on the First Amendment basis. The protection that is now being fiddled with in the public discourse that Julian will be denied. So that message alone to journalists of core in Australia and all around the world should be enough to say, wait a minute, so you're going to have a separate rule for American journalists called the First Amendment production, but anybody else who, who reports on their issues, exposes their corruption, their war crimes, he is fully exposed. That should send shockwaves, and I don't think people realize what kind of a horrible scenario could emerge from that. Well, it's exactly as uh, Stella said in her talk last night, uh, it's a war between accountability and impunity. And what you're talking about somewhat ensures impunity. Yeah, and we have so, of course we have so many stories reflecting that. Can you just imagine, now we have only 
We have, we have the, the, the torture program of the CIA exposed. Who has been held accountable for that? Not a single person. Only person who went to jail because of that is the whistleblower who exposed it. John Kiriak. That is the twisted world we now live in and exemplifies what we are dealing with and what people need to realize that we need to change, to change the scale and actually fight for against this impunity for these heinous acts. So can I ask you a, just a practical question? Uh, so we were awaiting for Julian to appear in front of those two judges. Um, do we have any idea of how soon that could happen? And after that, if they judge negatively, how soon it would be before he could possibly be extradited? Well, this is the issue. We have no idea. And this is part of the psychological warfare and torture against Julia to have this constant uncertainty on all steps of the case. There have been no indication of when that could happen. It could be a tomorrow that they announce that in a week's time there's going to be in the court. They can wait and wait and wait. But it could be before, the entire thing could be over in the British courts before summer recess on July 31st, before the end of the next month. But we simply don't know. And there's anybody's guess. And you have you cannot rely on any precedent in the court histories here, because all these precedents are null and void when it comes to Julian. There is a Julian's exemption on the way that judiciary has been handling his case from day one. Day one. Yeah. Well, Expose the fact it's nothing to do with the law. It's persecution, as I said in my talk here, cloaked in this uh, judicial uh, uh, fake curtain. It's a potenting curtains of a legal process that we are witnessing here. Yeah. And that has been exposed in yeah. the process in the courts here. Well, in the appeal, um, the case of Laurie Love was brought up and uh, Justice Burnett drew a distinction between Julian and Love because Love was suffering from a physical condition as well. Shouldn't that medical assessment, because the, the assurances only were only given on the basis of a mental health condition. Now, uh, since Julian, that was the very day Julian had his stroke, by the way, shouldn't that be the medical grounds be reviewed in view of the, the fact there is no a uh, doctor even in ADC, there's no doctor permanently on staff and it would be a very complicated procedure. Well, of course, uh, I am absolutely certain that the lawyers are looking into that, but you have to pass the hurdles to actually be heard in the court. Yes. That is the problem. What kind of justice is that you don't have actually a possibility to raise these arguments. But there's one more appearance. Can't it be stated that that distinction that Burnett made no longer applies? Well, as much as you can squeeze in the half hour that they have allocated for the total process. Yes. So that means the defense entire, gets 15 minutes, is that right? That is what we are, we are, we are saying, of course, and they need to extend that. Are you going to are, are you going to have 15 minutes to, to argue for his life? Is that the justice we're going to see here? I would not be surprised, but of course there would be a demand to extend that. I want to ask you about the end game here that we seem to be in. I know it's a political case, about popular uh, support for him that's really crucial, but there is a legal process. Yeah. At least in name, it's a legal process. Yeah. If what role could the European Court of Human Rights play, yeah. and how would that work out? Because I'm hearing that they would have to get either a judge here or the Ministry of Justice to issue the injunction. It doesn't come directly from here. That would give them time to lose the papers. Yeah. Is that what you're afraid of? Well, I, for one thing, you know, when I read Justice Swift's uh, uh, document, uh, which is not a, doesn't take you long, and you can read between the lines what kind of uh, 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 how dismiss, totally dismissive it is. He doesn't even try to hide the fact that he, I mean, he came to that uh, conclusion before he heard any argument, before he read a single document. I'm absolutely certain of that. It, it sort of reeks of that. 
Uh, it still took months. 11 months to issue. Well, nine months. I think. Nine, it's okay. issued in September. Uh, and and, and his, his name is ironically Justice Swift. Well, uh, but that's part of this, the uh, the psychological torture against Julia and the stalling process on every 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 step of the way. Now, we of course have now this 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 possibility, which Justice Swift has actually narrowed, to present the case for two judges and a renewed application for appeal. Which astonishingly, Swift can narrow the scope of the documents that are presented to 20 pages and actually only gives half an hour to present the case, which, which at least from the outset when I read it, it sounds like that's for both parties. So I'm, I'm saying, are, are they going to give him 15 minutes to, uh, to actually fight for his life? It's, it's absurd. So I'm not too hopeful for that outcome. What, of course, the lawyers for Julians are ready to uh, immediately petition to the, uh, the Strasbourg court to take his case on and issue uh, uh, a request to stay the extradition based on so-called Rule 39. Uh, that, that could be within hours uh, and uh, until now the British government has abided by the rule. But there's a lot of controversy and the, and the, the conservatives here in, 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 the, in this house uh, are furious that the Strasbourg court was interfering in the deportation of uh, refugees to Rwanda. So there's a huge opposition to that and I fear that they will either not wait for the, uh, the signal from uh, Strasbourg, you know, request to stay if it comes, because it only takes an hour to drive to the airport from Belmar's prison, or they will ignore Strasbourg court and find some legal justification that saying it's, it's not an order, it's just a, a request. So we're in the right to do so. And by the way, this is interference with our sovereignty and all that uh, BS that is being presented constantly and was the basis of the Brexit and for the basis of them uh, totally uh, shattering international institutions, the United Nations, uh, and mechanisms that have saved lives that have been destroyed in the Julian Julian's process. The working group of arbitrary detention, which was ignored, the, uh, uh, the, the special rapporteur on torture, that was totally ignored. Can you imagine? They've undermined the international system, this fragile system which our human rights globally is based on. This is the intensity of the fight that we are fighting. It's on all fronts and nothing is spared. So I do fear that the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights will not get a chance to intervene or will be ignored and dismissed if they do. Even though it's legally binding on Britain. And they haven't, there is legislation, I think, to get out of that. But I they're have, still in I, it. I, have, I spoke about the laws and yeah. the, 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 right. the, the legal scholars. I've seen an Oxford yes. scholar in this country write, and you can just imagine what kind of a party affiliation he has. Uh, his, his, his legal scholarly opinion that you can actually ignore Rule 39 but still be a part of the treaty. What I'm really afraid of is that uh, even if the European Court of Human Rights decides to intervene and, and issues are, are, are requests or order to stay the extradition, it will be ignored here. Uh, and they will find some legal justification to say that, yes, we will abide by the treaty in generally for a while at least, because there's so much in the balance there. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement, peace in Northern Ireland, is basically hanging on that, uh, that, that, that uh, human rights treaty. So they, that's the only reason why they haven't dismissed it entirely so far. But they will find some legal scholar, and I've actually seen papers explaining that, yes, you can uh, decide not to abide by Rule 39, but still be a part of the treaty. So this is what I, I call, you know, what I'm afraid of. And this is how fascism creeps up upon you with the good help of, of lawyers. There's always enough lawyers who are willing and able to create this, this, this fancy paperwork or take part in court proceedings, creating the justification and the facade of legality. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm afraid to come to that, but for that uh, to happen or stopping that to happen, of course, we need uh, 
a, a universal outcry, an outrage, especially among the European leaders who have cowardly and shamefully stayed silent when not even supporting the Prime Minister of Australia and the opposition leaders. How is it that, that we have to go to Latin American presidents to get full support from country after country after country who issues statement and takes the issue up with the, the Biden's uh, uh, himself personally? Half a billion people in these countries that I visited in the last few months in Latin America were totally on board and understand the gravity because that's in their living memory they know what they're dealing with you know you don't have to convince anybody in latin america about you know kidnapping killing plans of the cia uh -huh, of course i mean that's right that's why involvement of of the department of justice in 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 in, uh, in a corrupt court proceedings like they did against lula now it is well established that the brazilian president was unjust to, 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 was 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 basically thrown in jail on cooked up charges and the Department of Justice the US did have a hand in, the, in that process, in the Petrobras case, etc, etc. So they understand. And I, I am I'm so frustrated that we are not getting these voices on the top political level in Europe because that's where the leverage could be. And uh, I thought it, we, would, we would be already there with the bipartisan support in Australia, with you know, that strong statements made by Albanese. And it was almost shattering when he was came over the coronation weekend to London and said, very diplomatically, I am frustrated. Well, we all know in diplomat speak what that means. Yeah. That is a, that is strong words. Uh, so other world leaders that actually do care about President need to support him as well. So what are we dealing with? We're trying to save an individual, a man's life. And, and, and the American government is even ready to sacrifice or upset relations with their most important, important partner in the Pacific, which is now a member of this little cozy NATO expansion over to the Pacific in the AUKUS alliance. That is remarkable, but that should be a wake-up call to people. This is where we are. It is about Julian, yes, as an individual, but it's about underlying principles that are at stake here. This is the line in the sand for so many things. So many things. Thank you, Chris. Everything's been asked and said a million times. So oh, that's a difficult moment. Uh, I feel like the fight is on, to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, naive and uh, I'm not despondent. I'm not. I, I feel like the stakes are so high right now, and that people really need to pull together and, and fight for Julian because we can really win this. Uh, we can also lose it, but I. Whether we win or lose depends on on public outcry, on awareness, on people really calling this by its name, calling it out for what it is. I think this case is extremely unpopular in the United States, and the Biden administration would be foolish to want to be inside the United States during an election period. Um, everyone knows this case is extremely bad for, from every perspective um, and so if I were the Biden administration I would want him to be extradited and the way to stop that would be to end it somehow um, and I'm not I'm not you know in a position to uh, to dictate how they should end it so the question is that Julian needs to be free he needs to be free now and um, he hasn't done anything wrong. So squaring those things, um, we'll see. Just, just to be quiet. If the European Court were to intervene, uh, they need a judge here in Britain to issue that injunction. Is that right? Are you understanding? Um, well, what's happened? Basically, the, the, the British court has to. Uh, has to obey a rule 39 
injunction. Um, but they're gearing up not to, you know. They've, they've been talking about it for a long time. There's a think tank um, in, uh, in Ox out of Oxford that's kind of laid out all the arguments why, why um, they should defy it. So it's that's why it's so political because it. Basically, whether the government can get away with it or not depends on the climate and on, uh, you know, on, on opposition on the ground. It's not really about the courts. Um, so, we'll see. I've obviously written a lot about Julian Assange over the years. I've been very disappointed in colleagues in the media who have abandoned him. I mean, I remember when reporters from all the big papers were partners and celebrating him, and now they've uh, decided that he's the bad guy and they're going to let this happen. And uh, I'm just totally appalled, and I thought, you know, we have a responsibility to speak out of it. So that's why I'm here. Uh, you know, I just want to help like, as much as I can. So you know the Guardian, Guardian News in England? Yes, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know they're the ones that had the big, Julian's big scoop about... Um, uh, Collateral murder? Or? That's, that's yeah. yeah. Yeah, And also the one uh, about the CIA. You know, yeah, the Vault 7. The Vault yeah. 7 thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and he's got a list, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why journalists don't like Assange, honestly, is because they're, I mean, I'm going to say this, but they're jealous. He, he's got more scoops than all of the best uh, reporters in the world combined. Right. And and they don't like that, so they decide that he's not a journalist or not a publisher or any of those things. But, um, you know, the reality is he, he was incredibly successful at what he did. They, there's just resentment in right. the business about that. Yeah. Even in just terms of the sheer volume of, of material he's managed to right. release. So exactly, so exactly. And, and not only that, the, the reasoning, um, they really didn't like. They, did, they really didn't like the idea that people were entitled to information without it being filtered first, you know? And, um, you know, even, I, I'm gonna say this, even I didn't like that at first. And I didn't I didn't think it through until much later, you know? What, what was it that made you uneasy? Hmm? What was it that made you uneasy at first? Well, I thought, oh, this is responsible journalism. You know, you have to sort out the information that, you know, could hurt people. There could be, you know, names that could get people in trouble, blah, blah, blah. But the reason they condition you to think that way is because the, they want you to, to believe that information doesn't belong to people, right? It belongs to governments, uh, that it has to be filtered out by the responsible folks. Um, but it's our information, it belongs to us. They don't have a right to keep it from us. And he, he was right about that, and I was wrong about that. Yeah, and in the end, he did, they did actually go through quite a lengthy process of redaction, didn't they? Mm -hmm. they, went, they actually did go through a, a lengthy process of redaction. They did, yes, originally, yeah. In, the, in those original partnerships. Yeah, yeah. And look, I, I think that was a good concession on his part, right? I think that was smart. Um, but eventually it just became too much. You know, they, 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 they decided they couldn't bear to have this much stuff coming out. And I would love to know the whole story about how, how that turn happened because they, they got all the big newspapers, all the big media companies uh, to you know to turn their backs on him and it, it was it was very successful it's sad really yeah if you had, if you could make one point to the UK government about his case against extradition what would that be you say? well I'm gonna say this in the speech but if this were Andre Sakharov or Nelson Mandela would we be would the government of the United Kingdom be extraditing a figure like that to the Soviet Union or to the South African government for you know this heinous kind of punishment? Of course not. This is a massive international health uh, human rights violation, and the UK government's going to be complicit in it, they, and they will be for all history. And they're making a huge mistake, you know, for the for the expediency of a temporary relationship. It's just it's so irresponsible and stupid, you know. So. Thank you very much. Okay, nice. thank you. What it's brings just, you here today? We're campaigning for the release and all extradition proceedings against Julian Assange to be halted. All he did was reveal details of US war crimes to the wider public. 
and it's under a, a right to know. We have a right to freedom of information. What would you say, if you had to choose one key aspect of his defence against extradition, what would that be? I would say his mental health, his physical health. Right. For real? Would you like to say a few words about what brings you here today? Uh, just my disgust, really. My disgust of being English. Basically, oh well, being a citizen that allows this to happen. It's disgusting. Right? It's our tax money. We're, we're political prisoners in this country. We're killing people. We're killing a, a hero, basically. Julian Assange could have done a lot of good for the world. And he kind of stopped a couple of wars. And that's why he's in there. And it's, it is really disgusting that these swines, for want of a better word, in Parliament can get away with that. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to stop it. Revolution maybe is a bit extreme, but build a guillotine, people. We're going to need them. That's <laughs> just so appalling. Complete lack of faith in the British justice system. If you could say one thing to the British government about this this case, what would you say? Well, free to the The judges are just corrupt. They're political. They're not independent of the of the politicians, they're doing what the politicians want and they're doing what America wants. Can you tell me what's brought you here today? Admiration for a hero, Julian Assange, who speaks the truth, reveals all crimes of corruption and is now paying the price for it. But people make a little bit of a, a contribution to standing up to say this is not right. We've got to, we've got to stand up and say no to this. If you could say, point out any aspect of the case to the UK government, what's the most important part of Julian's case, would you say? The most important part of his defence against extradition? Yeah. Well, he's, he's got, there's no charge to answer. He hasn't broken any rules, any laws, really. I mean, he's told the truth with evidence. Um, they, it's just a totally political setup to shut him up and, and send a chilling message to other journalists. You don't report on the crimes we're doing, you know. So I don't think he's got a, a case to answer. Actually, it's just contrived crap. Nelson Mandela and you know various other voices of freedom. If, if they had anything to say today, I think it's pretty clear what they would be saying. You know that you know that, that, that it's complete injustice, and the, it's important that the truth be known to the pe people. You know, it, it's, it's the public domain. These are public servants. What, what they are getting up to in our name should be known to us. You know, whereas we are private citizens, citizens and we're the ones whose uh, lives should be kept that way, you know, but it, it would seem to be the other way around, they're, they're mounting these mass surveillance operations on us, uh, and they've just uh, announced in the EU, Brussels announced a couple of days ago, that the, they're going to make it lawful to spy on journalists, you know, to in, install spyware on their phones and computers in order to find out who their sources are, you know, whereas the, the previous sort of um, word on that was that journalists had protected freedoms uh, and th th they had the right to protect their sources and things but they now done a complete vote pass on that yeah. and they're now saying that you know we, we, and it all stems from the Assange case like you know that these sort of things were unheard of until they went after Assange you know and, and we've been seeing it ever since you know first they came for Assange uh, and, you know, it, it's obvious that, that was, it was just a precedent for what they were planning and doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the slippery slope's getting pretty steep now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you, and you can't rule out as well the overreach of the American government, you know. He, Assange has never been in the, US, the United uh, States. Uh, he's committed no crime there. But they don't like what he's yeah. saying about them. And uh, they're, they're reaching into this country and trying to extract them out, you know, it's, 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 again, it's a first, it's a precedent, uh, and it, the, the implications for that, you know, for, you know, the future going forward, it, it's basically saying if, if you say anything against the US government that we don't like, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, we'll get you, you know, so, I mean, who, who's going to... Who, who's, who's going to stand up and reveal the truth anymore if, if that's the sort of circumstances they find themselves in? So it's, yeah, um, 
it's, it's in so many levels important. So it, it's really important to be here today and you know let these people know that we're not finished with us. We still have something to say and we want them to listen. The more people we can get to join us in saying that, the more chance of success we have. You know? <laughs> Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> you too. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Okay. Yeah. It's consortium and, uh, news. Yeah. Uh, support consortium news. I, I read it all the time. I'm sorry. Thank you, consortium news. And if you can help to keep it going, the perform miracles and, and today's landscape of news telling the perform miracles. <laughs> Thank you. Keep it up. Thank you.